Hello and welcome to another session in the living room brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. If you're watching this live, you can join in the conversation via YouTube, Facebook or Twitter. Presage your question with hashtag Curzon Living Room and let us know where you're writing from and we'll get through as many of your questions as we possibly can in the time that we have. I'm joined today by the filmmaker Ruben Ostland. Hello, Ruben. Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, home in Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, so, and yeah, enjoy this um, uh, event. It's a great idea, I think. Um, so, a lot of people will have watched Force Majeure, which has uh, come back onto Curzon Home Cinema, and we're going to talk about that, but obviously we'll be able to talk about your earlier film, Play, and also your Cannes Palme d'Or winning uh, film, The Square. But let's start with Force Majeure. Um, now, I know that in your 20s, you were an avid skier and you also made extreme sports videos. And I was just wondering about the genesis of Force Majeure. Is it something that came to you then as you were sort of skiing down a mountainside or filming someone else? I think that, um, you know, I was spending maybe five or six years in the, in the Alps and in North America filming skiing in the winters and then editing ski videos like these expo extreme sport videos in the summers and when i had been doing that for a while i was so tired of that kind of environment so when i started film school in gothenburg i just felt i never want to go back to a ski resort uh, but then when i made my first feature film and my second feature film i also knew that i had a certain kind of knowledge of that environment that i wanted to use in 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 a film in a fiction film but i didn't i didn't know how to do it because i didn't have an idea that i thought was interesting enough uh, uh that could take place there uh so so in in many ways in many ways it was like my my background as a skier that wanted me to go back to that environment and i mean the the moment when it then i realized now it's possible to do a movie there was um uh, uh i was watching a youtube clip that was uh, a group of tourists on uh, outdoor restaurants in the in the French Alps, and um, when they are sitting there, it's an amateur camera capturing this. Uh, when they are sitting there in the sun, suddenly there's an avalanche that is starting to tumbling down the mountain, and uh, that clip was very interesting because it was in the beginning everybody was sharing and 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 thought it was beautiful with this avalanche coming closer, but in three seconds this joyful sharing goes over to complete panic and everybody runs away and leaving their meals uh, but then it turns out it was just a false alarm it's only the snow smoke that reached reached the restaurant so so people became ashamed and they have to walk back to the meals again and they have exposed something by themselves when they were panicking so that that video was something that i uh, were fascinated by and i wanted to put a family on that terrace uh, but my idea was that the whole family should run um, but then i told this to a friend of mine at that time it also were three different stories that was taking place in tourist environment one was like on a bus journey one was on a, a ferry and and one was on a ski resort um, and but then i told a friend of mine about this uh, this uh, uh, avalanche incident that I wanted to film and he listened very carefully uh, when I was telling about it and then the next day he came back to me and he said what if it's only the father that runs uh, and leaves his family and in the moment when he said that I immediately understood here is the movie I can cut out the two other stories this is what I'm going to base uh, uh, my next feature film the, the idea was so direct Everybody I told about it immediately understood uh, that that you will respond to this this setup. So so it was actually that moment when he said to me, "What if only the father runs?" That is like the okay, I understood. This is going to be an easy movie to, to write. I had no problem writing it. I understood how I would want to write it immediately. Uh, one of the few films where uh, where I felt it had been easy to write it. I, I kind of like the idea of this this three part film that you originally had the yeah. idea of. It strikes me that it probably would have been to masculinity in crisis what the Keanu Reeves film Speed was to action movies. It's just yeah, yeah, taking yeah. it one step further each time. Um, yeah. So this this non avalanche event happens, 
and uh, Thomas runs away. One of the things that really fascinated me the first time I saw it, and again watching it today, it, it really struck home, is the fact that the tension created is not just by what Thomas did, but you hold off for so long with ever actually raising the issue yeah. with him. I'm just curious in the writing process, did you always know that you're going to have this length of time where there's this unspoken thing between them and, and you leave the audience in suspense as to when it's going to happen? Yeah, I felt that quite uh, uh, early when I, in the writing process, as soon as they start to uh, talk about it too much, there was some pressure leaving the film. And uh, um, so I realized that I wanted them to have a, a, a problem of talking about it and not getting to the to the core of the of the problem. Or, but you know, actually, they are talking about it already the first night after the avalanche have happened. But then it just comes out that Thomas have started to create his own version completely out of it, and then that that of course builds the pressure. But as yeah. soon as he admits, which is basically in the middle of the film. Uh, I was very interested in that moment also because uh, some some thought that I should have it later, but but they were saying because then problem is solved, and I was saying no problem is not solved only because he admits it. They will still have a huge problem how to deal with this because he have broken a contract of who he should be as a man, and 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 Ebba will never forgive him anyway, or maybe she can intellectually forgive him, but can she can she emotionally forgive him? Uh, so. Yeah. It's also interesting um, the way that when Eber talks about this over the two meals, uh, first with Brady Corbet and Karen Marenberg, and then with Christopher Hibshu afterwards. I, I find it fascinating that when she's talking about this, you cut to them and show their expressions. And so I kind of, um, particularly with Christopher, when you cut to that moment of seeing <laughs> that realization in his face that, yeah. oh, shit, what yeah, are we yeah. doing here? <laughs> Uh, well, that was something really that happened during the shooting because Christopher Hibbia have such a fantastic uh, 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 mimics in his face, and 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 you could see him, him. He almost didn't dare to look at Thomas when he realized what he had done. So it was really something that happened during during the shooting that and that I, I remember when I was editing it that that I wanted to keep in that way. But it's interesting because, because when it comes to cutting dialogue scenes, I don't know how to do it. I must say, I cut uh, very much myself, but every time I'm trying to cut a dialogue scene, there's no structure that I know how to follow or it's, it's, a, it's a constantly trying over and over and over again until I finally think that I find something that is surprising or that is expressing something more about the scene. But I don't have any, uh, I don't know if there is any, uh, how do you say, formula of how you should fuck, cut the dialogue scene. But, but I always try to do something that is a little bit unexpected because if you're only cutting on the dialogue who is talking, uh, of course, then it becomes very much about the information and, uh, in, in the dialogue. And I, you want to avoid that, at least in, in the kind of situations that I have, because then, it also about like the social socializing that is going on. How do you highlight how people have problems of socializing and and um, uh, yeah this this kind of awkwardness that I of, often are aiming for in my sense. I want to come back to awkwardness in a short while, but I've got a question here from Elena Seyman, who is writing from Turkey. And um, they ask, what kind of research do you do in human weaknesses and psychology when creating your characters? Um, I, when, I, when I was doing Force Majeure, I, I, I love sociology. Uh, I think it's very interesting to go uh, to sociological experiments uh, and looking at human behavior in general. And I rather do that than creating a character I'm trying to find out uh, situations that is bringing us up as human beings and that we would probably react in the same way, all of us, or at least there's a possibility for us to react in the same way. And that is what I love about sociology, that we are like, we are studying human behavior uh, without pointing fingers at the individual. We are not saying this is because your character are in this way. We are just saying, because we are humans, we act in this way. 
And, and that is a very sympathetic way of approaching us when we are making errors and mistakes, I think. Um, and when it came to force majeure, well, I read a couple of different studies. One was about uh, sociological studies. One was about airplane hijackings. Uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that people couple uh, that have been in airplane hijackings, the percentage of divorce is extremely high afterwards. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I guess it's kind of common that you maybe see a side of your partner that doesn't fit the image of uh, who you want him to be or her to be. You want them to be heroes or you want them to be someone that is dealing with this in a, in a, from, from, the, from the expected way of how we should be a, a man or how we should protect our family. So, so from that study, it turns out that we're in these extreme situations. Uh, we are, often get disappointed at each other. We, we get disappointed on like that, that people are trying to save themselves or... Um, and then the most interesting part of researching for Force Mayor was, um, uh, I read a study that was about ferry catastrophes, ship catastrophes. Uh, ship that had gone under and it was it was covering up from Titanic to Estonia uh, uh, all the data of how how many survivors who have survived the age of the one that have survived the age of the one that have they died the sex uh, of the people that have survived etc and it turns out that um, uh, Thomas behavior when it comes to the avalanche is probably what most men would do when it comes to a, a crisis situation like that. The one that survives when it comes to a, a Titanic or, or, or a ship that goes under, first of all, it's the crew because they know exactly where to go. But then it's men in a certain age. And, and, and what the scientists actually brought up as a factor is that men have an ability of acting egoistic when it comes to a survival uh, moment. And uh, th this has been very interesting to talk about, ex especially to women, because this, they say, ah, oh, my, my, my partner would never react in that way, you know, like Thomas. In and then you can say, yeah, probably, <laughs> if you look at the statistics, he will, you know. Um, uh, I, I, so. I guess that this is one of the things I find really fascinating with the film and in, in terms of the character of Thomas. Some people say he's acting out of instinct, right or wrong, this, that's, that's the situation. Um, then there's another way of looking at it that, that I thought about, that he, even in a split second, he holds his self-worth higher than the other members of his family. Mm. And I was just wondering if, if yours was much more the instinct, this is what they do, and they don't even think about it, or is there something in him that he says, well, actually, you know what? I'm the most important. Uh, I don't look at it as a... Uh, an intellectual or rational decision that he makes. He just gets very scared and in survival instinct, he runs away. But maybe it's also something in the way that I directed a scene that is not 100% perfect. Because when he's running, I'm also making fun of him a little bit too much. When I look at the scene today, he's screaming and he's like, uh, uh, yeah, I, He's almost acting like a coward. And maybe it would be interesting if I was, would direct it today, maybe I would make it less clear exactly what he's doing. Maybe I, I would make it possible for the audience also to say, no, nah, but really what should he do, you know? But, but yeah, that, that's at least something that I've been thinking about when it comes to the avalanche. Should I tone, his, tone him down a little bit? Uh, should I should I make him a little bit like no stay a little bit longer with his family? I've got uh, this isn't so much a question, but it it certainly proves the point that you've been making. This is from P. W. Hals. Um, I've seen this film twice, and my position hasn't changed. Thomas is right. I would have fled, saved myself, taken a couple of bread rolls for survival, and that probably explain, explains why I'm both single and childless. Um, <laughs> so thank you for your honesty, whoever you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, just thinking about your experience uh, filming extreme sports at the beginning, 
I know you you also went to film school, but did that give you a, a kind of a training that helped with this? Because it strikes me that that's fast cutting, sometimes very kinetic, but you're known for these beautifully composed shots. And I was just wondering about your kind of the experiences you've had as a filmmaker. Yes, I think so, because, you know, when you are filming skiing, uh, I love I loved these years when you were filming skiing because it was so, it was me that had a big backpack on me, a camera and a tripod, and maybe two or three skiers who just went out in the mountain. And that, that was as big as the film crew was, you know, and then it often was like this, I'm climbing up on one side of a mountain peak and the, and the skier is going on the other side of a, of a mountain. I'm quite far away from them often. And then when you're filming skiing or these extreme sports, the goal is to show as spectacular stunts as possible. Uh, but when the skier is pulling it off, when they are managing to do it without falling or uh, uh, et cetera. And the longer a run is, the more skillful the skier is, of course. If he can pull off many tricks and, and ski an advanced line and, and do it in a dynamic and a beautiful way, then, then, then that's the best ski run that you can, you can shoot. So, and in ski films, it's, it's kind of forbidden to cut and try to connect different takes to pretend that the skier is doing a longer run than he's doing. It's basically as an evidence material that yeah. you have been shooting. So, and, and it, for me, when I shot this year, when you were shooting a skier that was skiing in, new, in, in powder on a mountainside that you are a little bit nervous that maybe it will start sliding, you know, maybe the avalanche will happen. It was almost a danger that was connected to it. The presence that was for you as a cameraman was so great. You know, you were like 100% focused on what was going on on the other side and, and you only have one, shot because after the skier have done the run then it's a track then it's not as beautiful as that it was before so i think i always wanted to go back to this kind of feeling when i've been shooting the fiction films you know how do we create that kind of intensity even if we're not dealing with anything that is dangerous uh and for me to set up the limitation of we have to pull off the scene in one take uh, because uh, i don't want to be able to save the scene afterwards by cutting it together and then I can build up a kind of intensity and a presence from everybody on, 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 on a set by repeating over and over, going take after take. And what happens is often that around take 20, you reach a quite high level, but then it starts going down. Suddenly the takes are being less good. Uh, and hopefully you manage to push it up again and make everybody like, okay, we have now reached a level that is above take 20. And then if I have time, I go for an hour break. And then when we get back, then I tell everybody, okay, everybody, five takes left. Now we do a counter and then make everybody feel like we are going to win this together. We are going to pull off the best take together now. And then four takes left, come on now. <clears throat> and very often it's the second last take that is the best one. The last take is not very often the best one, but the second last take is very often the best one. And for me, I think for me and the team and the actors and everybody, it gives a strong feeling of satisfaction because it feels at least that we have pushed the day as far as we can, that we have done the best job we can do instead of like taking a little part from that angle, a little part from that angle, et cetera, et cetera. It's also an unsatisfying way to work because you will not be able to see the result until you are in the editing room. So uh, yes, it definitely have influenced my way of, of filming. The, the other thing that you, you've done, and the, the first time I was fully aware of this and reading about it was uh, the short film from 2010, Instant by a Bank. Uh, Incident that, by a Bank. Yes. That, yeah. you sh that you shot with a static camera, but then it was very um, high res, so you were able to zoom in and move mm. around, even though it was the same single shot. Um, I gather you did that in Force Majeure as well, if I'm not mistaken, with certain shots. Uh, in play, I did it more than in right. Force Majeure, but I zoomed in a little bit in Force Majeure also. Uh, I zoom in a little bit in, in all the films, where whenever I feel that I want to recompose the picture, but... Uh, but the reason that I did it in Incident by Bank, because me and a friend of mine, 
uh, my producer, Eric Hemmendorf, we were witnesses to a, a, a robbery attempt. Uh, and uh, I thought before I witnessed that robbery attempt that I knew what a robbery would look like. But when it suddenly happens on the other side of the street, it turns out that all the references that I have from fiction films is not useful. I can't even recognize reality anymore because my expectation on how they should act and what should happen is, is completely not there. So, and this incident by a bank, I, I, it actually, I think if you Google it, I think you can watch it. Uh, it's uh, on Vimeo on now. Vimeo, yeah. And, yeah. and then I wanted to do a reconstruction of my experience of this robbery because I, I felt that we need to give this reference to people what, what, what a rob robbery probably looked like more often than what we have seen in, in the fiction movies. And, and the reason that I wanted to use the real time in that movie, because uh, we, have a, we have, as you said, we had a fixed camera and then we are zooming in and panning um, uh, in, in the uh, digital, uh, how do you say? Yeah, in the digital image afterwards. Uh, was because there were so trivial things going on just at the same time as uh, people were shooting with, with guns. And I thought like, you know, if people start shooting with guns, the world will stop. Everybody will throw themselves on the ground. Uh, there will be like uh, this, uh, everybody will act like it's a crisis situation. But what happened then when I saw this, people were shooting with the guns and there were people coming with ice cream, getting closer and like licking the ice cream, trying to see what's happening. The, 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 the life was just continuing on the street like nothing had happened. And it, uh, it, it was so painful to see when the robber, they got caught and the guards were pushing them down on the ground. And you know, it was like probably their most dramatic event that would happen in their life. And suddenly I see on my watch, oh, I, we have to go now. Do you know the way, Do you know, the world just continues. So no one is the uh, protagonist or the antagonist of our lives. And, and, and it was also painful to see that it was something about it that was like so against the expectations of like when you, uh, when you, when you, when you witness something like that. So the real time for me was very important. So, so it's 11 minutes and it's guns going off and people are talking about completely trivial things and it's, it's just next to each other. So. I've got another question here from Bryony Wright from London. A lot of your films focus on the pressures and the expectations of masculinity within society. Would you say this is true? And do you have any plans to explore the opposite female predicament? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I definitely believe that is true. Definitely when, since, since Force Mayor, uh, the square and also in triangle of sadness that I'm, I'm working on now. Um, well, I, I, you know, since I'm a man, I really like to go to my own experiences and what I have to deal with myself. Um, 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 let's see. I'm, I'm all, almost considering triangle of sadness as the last part of three movies. Maybe we can call it a trilogy about uh, about being a man in these modern times, but uh, uh, but but it it have been also this this decade have been interesting. It have been interesting to be a man. There have been a lot of pressure on the man. It have the man have suddenly been from going from being the norm. He have been put in the limelight, and everybody's looking at the uh, the behavior of men and and. Um, um, uh, suddenly daring to question it, daring to, um, yeah, um, to really go, go and investigate it in a, in a new way. So uh, I think that all the characters in at least Force Mayor and, and, and um, uh, the Square and Triangle of Sadness are men also that is very aware of what the expectation of what they should be. And, and maybe they also know that my behavior actually is not living up to that expectation. So. You have this interesting situation towards the end of before we get on the bus in Force Major, um, where Eber understands that whether or not the construct of the family as, as it exists in society is the right construct, that something needs to change. This contract needs 
to to be brought back into line and i find it really fascinating that she just says okay this is the hero but we know he's not the hero <laughs> we know she's completely controlled everything here and it yeah. is interesting that that she is the person who is taking control of the situation mm. and just say look i'll let you have your moment as a bloke but yeah yeah we know yeah. who's false yeah it was uh that was not originally idea for the ending it was i was actually writing the ending and i knew that i wanted them to go up and ski in fog it's a very special feeling to ski in fog if you, all of you that have been in in the mountains and skiing in fog because it's a complete whiteout and you can't see anything it's a scary feeling uh and it's one of these few places where you experience this complete white uh, white world or white space uh, so I was fascinated by the, that, uh, and I, once again, for me, so many of my ideas come up in a dialogue with other people. Uh, so I started to tell this to my producer. Yeah, I want them to go to this peak, and I want them to ski down in 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 the fog. And and I think he said like one sentence or something. Yeah, maybe maybe Thomas can save them then, or maybe he can show them the way down. And then ah. Uh, there you, we have it, you know. Of course, they should stage uh, uh, the father in the family to be a hero and save, and just in order to restore the old old roles of the family. Um, so it's also quite funny watching that sequence. I haven't seen the American remake Downhill, uh, yeah. uh, the film, but it struck me that if this was an American film, we wouldn't have the construct of seeing Ebel organizing this. It would no, have no. just been the father saves everyone <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah. But what, instead, what we have is this sequence then on the bus. And yeah. it's so funny, everyone I talk to has a different theory of what this is. Yeah. And I don't necessarily want you to tell us what it is, but I'm just curious about your decision to have Charlotte remain on the bus. Uh... And she in herself is a fascinating character anyway. Yeah, 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 exactly. <clears throat> well, I think that I one idea with uh, Charlotte, she is this promiscuous woman that is living out uh, outside the conventions of uh, how a nuclear family should be and the role of the woman. She, she probably has some affairs down in the Alps at the same time as she has a, a family at home. And so my idea was to exactly mess a little bit around with what you talked about before you, you said like in an american movie they he would save ebba for real and in a conventional american movie charlotte would probably be the one that gets punished in some way in the end because she has stepped out and out of the box and acting in a way that is not uh, yeah not not our conventional uh, idea about how a woman should be so i I wanted like when everybody's stepping out of the bus and they are very scared that the bus should go over the cliff edge. Uh, that Charlotte should be the only one that is in the bus and it's almost like yeah now she's going to have the punishment because of his her sinful lifestyle, but instead the bus just goes away and she is the one that survives <laughs> and I have no it's like messing up with expectations a little bit. I don't know if I managed to do it in a very clear way, but at least for me, it gave, gave me a lot of joy just thinking about like Falok is the only one that is on the bus, you know. So you, you've got this ending, which is fantastic, and it takes us off in a different direction that I just had no uh, idea that that was how it was going to end. And then thinking when you moved on to, to the square, you've got so many different ideas going on, so many narrative strands and juggling them all. You mentioned earlier about um, Force Major being uh, an easier thing to write. W was it a, a challenge to balance everything in to, to create the square? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was very close that I didn't uh, uh, film the square after Force Major because it was very late in the process before I realized how I should solve it uh, and how I could keep the thematic in the film clear or how I could pull all these strings together in some way uh, in order to make it uh, to make it make sense and uh, uh, so but for me uh, when I realized okay it, it is possible to to make a film about this it was when the PR agency 
the public relation agency uh, came up as an idea uh, uh, that they should promote these humanistic values that the square is representing. And they are uh, taking on that task. How do we bring out this message that everybody agrees on to this new media landscape when you need a conflict to get attention? Uh, so it was in, 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 in that layer that I suddenly, okay, if I use that as a red thread into the film, then maybe I can add the thing with uh, Thomas being robbed. Uh, and then, then it was possible for me to build a structure around that. Uh, but I don't think that, I think the first pitch I did of the square, I was telling Sina, uh, my wife, uh, about the square in 2000. And what was it now? 2015. Uh, and I think the first pitch I did took like two hours and 40 minutes when I was trying to tell her about the film. It was a, a nightmare to pitch that film to someone. Because, like, uh, and, and when it came from Force Majeure, when you say it's a family on vacation, an avalanche comes, the father runs away. Okay, how did, who, do they deal with that? And everybody is with you. But when it came to the square, it was so hard to do it. Um, uh, and your, your writing yeah. process, I remember you know, I, I had the chance to chat with you when, when the film came out in the UK. And your writing process, you, you, it's not just a treatment that you write, it's almost like a novel, it's, it's prose, isn't it, that your, your screenplay? Yes, I have uh, uh, published uh, both Force Majeure and The Square as a book in Sweden. Uh, and then I have someone else that is transforming it to American Standard script because I think it's so boring to write American Standard uh, scripts. I, 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 I think it's so boring to read American Standard scripts. I have a very hard time to get connected to, to, to something that is written in that form. It's, it's just, um, I'm not skillful enough to do it. So, so for me, when I write it in a more, in a more novel uh, form, I then I then as a di director I can also investigate what are the characters thinking about what is the, really the core of the scene uh, which pauses in the dialogue should be really long uh, how do I uh, uh, what is it really that I'm interested in in every scene I can go to the core what am I really really interested in with this scene and this situation uh, and for me writing that it becomes like a process of trying to figure that out for myself. Uh, and and uh, then it makes sense for me to write a script. But you know, or to write a script as a manual for the shooting, I think this, then it's something else because when the, the script is finished for me, then it takes a long time to break it down exactly what should we keep? Uh, what should we take away? What is not necessary? That's another part of the process. And then when we have decided, oh, these are the images that we are going to tell the film through, that is really the, the, the manual, or how do you say, the, the part where I can show the team, okay, this is what we're going to do. Here you can read my intention, but this is actually what we're going to feel. So. Um, I know we're, we're almost out of time, but just a couple of short questions. Uh, one, I'm always fascinated um, with the idea of, is there such a thing as too far uh, with certain directors? And I know that your eight man sequence in the square went on longer than, than what we eventually see on the screen. Do you have something inside you that, that so, it says, whoa, that's too much, that's too far. That's, or do you just say, you know, to hell with it, let's see where this goes. Okay, I can tell you something that we are up to shooting right now. And when I started to shoot it, I was not, I was like, okay, let's see if I want to push it this far in the, in the next film. In Triangle of Sadness, you know, tri Triangle of Sadness, then it's um, uh, the two main characters of, of the film is, is two models, a male model and a female model, and they, they are a couple. And I have been interested in beauty uh, since beauty is one of the currencies that can make us traveling class society, even if we don't have money or we have education. Beauty can be a, like winning the lottery ticket where you actually can get up to a, another part of society than you may become from. And uh, the two models, they go on a luxury yacht uh, where they meet the creme de la creme of our society, the really rich people in our society. 
but, but the thing on, on this yacht, there, there's a captain that's, that is a Marxist. And uh, this Marxist captain is going to be played of Woody Harrison. Um, and what he does is that he always checks the weather forecast before he decides when to have the captain's dinner. And the captain's dinner is a very fancy dinner with a seven meal course, you know, when the, when the most important guests are sitting next to the captain. And <clears throat> so he's always like, ah, rough weather on Thursday. Ah, it's time for the captain's dinner. And slowly what happens in the scene, we have shot mostly of it, is that people, <coughs> people are getting more and more seasick and then it's going to be like an, you know, they're they going to throw up and throw up and throw up and throw up. And when I was writing the script, I wanted also to be a point where they also get food poison and they start shitting. So they're shitting and they're throwing up and they're throwing up and they're shitting. And the Marxist captain, he get, <clears throat> gets very drunk. So he gets up to the, the board where you're steering the boat, you know, and uh, he starts to read from the communistic manifest to this <laughs> shitting and throwing up billionaires and models. Um, and when I started to film these scenes, I, in the beginning, I was thinking they should be very explicit. You know, it should be like when the audience think that they have had enough, I'm going to push it 10 times harder. Uh, uh, because if I do that, then it will be something, then it will be a metaphor, then it will be, but if I go halfway, it's not going to be anything, but I have to push it so, so much. I have to, they have to throw up and they have to shift, you know, like that was the plan. And, and, and then when I started to shoot these images, uh, <laughs> I was just feeling, I, I, I feel embarrassed myself, you know, I, feel, I felt embarrassed of how can I come up with something, I, an idea like it? How can I force people to do these things for me, you know? So, but let's see, in the editing, uh, uh, I, I, I will decide how far I'm going to push it. I, I, I just think there should be a warning on posters. Uh, if you've eaten a meal before seeing this film, don't see this exactly, film. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, just two quick final questions. First of all, I've got uh, one from Patrick Swords. I think this is more a request than a question. Um, where do you keep your palm door? Uh, I, I had it here before, but now I have it in the, in the office. I, my, my teenage, I have teenager daughters, you know, and they have parties at this place. And I just felt, oh, I, I, it would be, they can trash the apartment, but they can't trash the pump. <laughs> I, I, I took it to the, uh, to the office. And one last question. Um, the film opens with the most extraordinary rendition of Vivaldi. Who recorded that? Where did you find that music? In uh, yeah, it was, uh, <clears throat> I used, yeah. Once again, I've used YouTube as a research for trying to be inspired. And I share a lot of uh, YouTube videos to friends. I think this is maybe just what everybody does today. But but when I wrote uh, Force Majeure, I, it was not all the people I know that did this. But, but then we found it was a young boy that was playing an accordion that was maybe 13 or 14 years old or something. We found a clip of this boy and he was playing Vivaldi with such uh, energy and, and uh, it was like super uh, it, fantastic to look at him. He had such a powerful ex expression. And also the, the, the song <clears throat> almost become desperate. Uh, when he's playing on the accordion, I mean, Vivaldi's uh, uh, summer, it's very beautiful to listen when, it, it's, when it's perfectly played but he ordered, uh, added some desperation to it also. So we asked him if he wanted to re-shoot or re-record when he was playing it. Now he was quite much older and much more skillful. So he didn't manage to, to capture the same kind of expression. So what we did was actually that we took the sound from that YouTube video, which is like just a, in a room like this, so it's very, the, uh, the sound is not good at all. Yeah, uh, but but because it had the right the right feeling to it. But it's, it's it's got that it's that wonderful counterpoint to the beautiful images that we see of the mountain yeah. side. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. If any of you have not seen Force Majeure yet, you can watch that and the square 
on Curzon Home Cinema. We also talked about Instant Buy a Bank, the short film from 2010. That's available to watch on YouTube and also Vimeo. And if you haven't seen Ruben's earlier film play, you can see that on, um, uh, you can download it from iTunes. Um, Ruben, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Um, now we've got a couple of events coming up over the course of the next few days. Tomorrow night at 8.30, Rubika Shah, the director of White Riot, a superb documentary about um, rock against racism in the 1970s going into the 80s, um, will be talking with Mark Commode. Then on Friday, the 1st of May at 8.30, I will be in conversation with Andrew Haig, the brilliant director of 45 years, who also directed Weekend and Lean on Pete. And I'll talk to him about all those films and also hopefully a little bit about his, his upcoming television series. And then on Saturday, the 2nd of May at one o'clock in the afternoon, Kitty Green, the director of The Assistant, an incredibly timely, a timely film, will be chatting with Anna Smith. That film actually opens uh, this weekend on Curzon Home Cinema. It's really worth watching. Um, as I said, it's very timely, but it's also got a superb performance by Julia Garner, who is one of the stars of Ozark. And I know most of us, um, or a lot of us, will have a little more spare time on our hands. So Hannah Drennan, who is one of the programmers with Curzon Home Cinema, has put together a program of long movies um, for you to watch. And it's a fantastic lineup. Uh, there's Tony Erdman and There Will Be Blood, which clock in at two hours and 40 minutes each. Then we go to three hours with The Wild Pear Tree, the great Chinese film song, My Son, and Andrei Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev. Beating that by an hour at four hours is Nymphomaniac, um, the two-part film by Lars von Trier. And then we go back to 1927 for Abel Gantz's excellent epic movie, uh, Napoleon, which in its time when it screened, the battle scene at the end was actually projected onto three screens from three projectors. Um, but it's still good to see on the small screen. That comes in at five and a half hours. And if you have a whole day to yourself and you're doing nothing else, you can watch Bellatar's mesmeric Satan Tango, which clocks in at an incredible seven and a half hours. Now, if any of you do watch that and you're actually able to tell me next time I'm hosting one of these events, uh, what actually happens at the 392nd minute of that film, then I will not only say your name on air, you will also have the enduring respect of the entire Curzon team. Thank you for joining us. Take good care of yourselves and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.